Hello, I'm Daryl Schrader, Director of Systems Integration for Western Information Management. We are a consulting firm with clients around the globe. We do records management work, like creating classification plans or retention schedules, and we provide technology solutions, like implementation and support of Tier 1 content management systems and development of custom software. We also do business consulting work, like developing strategic plans or consulting on information governance issues. If you are interested in talking about how we can help you with a project, or if you'd like a demo of our software tools, I'll provide contact information at the end of this presentation. Hopefully, you are here today for our presentation on cleaning up a shared drive. Many of our clients are interested in cleaning up the files on their shared drives. Sometimes this is in preparation for migrating the files to a new content management system. Or sometimes they might be merging several information sources into one. Or maybe there's a feeling that the shared drive is out of control and just needs to be organized and structured. Even though the client knows they need to do something, they don't really know where to start. I'll be providing an overview of the Western IM process for delivering this kind of project. This process has been developed from basic information management principles and has been honed over many years of working with clients to organize and structure their information. Let's take an overview of the Western IM process. Our first step is to take an inventory of the files on the shared drive, determining what it is that you actually have there. Next, we classify the files. We identify what types of information the files represent and we define the attributes and metadata that are needed for each type. Typically, this is also when we identify security and retention requirements. Next, we organize the files, grouping the files together in a way that will make sense to the user and make it easy to store the information and find it again. Once the new organization has been determined, we migrate the files into the new structure. This may be a migration to a new system, such as Microsoft 365, or it may just mean reorganizing the directory structure within the existing shared drive. Finally, we recognize the need to manage the system going forward, which means training users, monitoring the system to make sure that it stays in good operating order, and making modifications when business requirements change. Before we look at the steps in detail, Let's look at one overarching principle. Size does matter. But size may matter in a couple of ways that you're not really expecting. So let's take a look at that. If this was an information theory conference, I would talk about entropy and scalability. Those are $10 words. So let's use terms that are a little more approachable. Let's talk about complexity and volume. If I asked you to sort some black and white marbles, that would be pretty easy. It has low complexity. There are only two types of marbles, and it's easy to tell the difference between the two. Now, if I asked you to sort a million black and white marbles, that's not so easy anymore. It's still the same low level of complexity, but now the sheer volume makes the job difficult. If you make a mistake and a black marble gets in with the white ones, you might not even be able to see the wrong colored marble. Now, what if I ask you to sort Lego blocks? There are many different colors and many different shapes and many different sizes. It might be hard to tell where a block should go. Is that a pink block or is it a red block that has just faded a bit? If you put a slightly larger green block in with the smaller green blocks, you'll never be able to see that it's in the wrong group. That's a task with high complexity. Now say there are a million Lego blocks to sort. That has become a very difficult problem. You have all the difficulty of working with high complexity, plus all of the difficulty of working with large volumes. That's a nice story, but what does it have to do with a shared drive cleanup? The answer is that a shared drive cleanup tends to fall into that last category, high complexity and large volume. The shared drives that we see tend to have well over a million files, maybe 5 million or 10 million, sometimes more and the complexity set tends to be quite high. There may not even be any agreement on what groups the files should be sorted into. 
What makes it difficult is that people are good with complexity, but poor at high volumes. We see clients who have started to clean up their shared drives and they've migrated 10,000 documents or so, which is a good start. But then they look at the five or 10 million documents still left and they give up. They're never going to be able to deal with all of those documents. Now, computers are good with volume, but they struggle with high complexity. We see lots of clients that have migrated millions of documents, but all they've done is move everything as is from one system to another, the so-called lift and shift. They still have the same mess, it's just in a new system. The challenge is to use the human capacity for complexity to simplify the task to the point where the computer can deal with a large volume. Now let's talk about the individual steps of the process. Here are a couple of principles for the first step, inventory. To find where you are going, you must know where you are. Because I'm an engineer, this is one of my favorites. When we measure, we know. So, inventory. If you're planning to go from here to there, it's important to first know where here is. You need to take stock of what you have, and then you can decide what you want to do with it. Now, sometimes our clients will say to us, well, we know what's on our network shared drive. We have Word documents and PDF versions, Excel spreadsheets, maybe some PowerPoint files. And we'll say to them, well, do you have any video? Oh, no, we don't do any video. And then it turns out the training department uses video extensively and they have all these video files that need to be taken care of. Or maybe we'll ask, oh, do you have any data automation? Do you have programs that are automatically moving files around? Oh no, we don't do any of that. And then it turns out, well, their intranet is on their network share drive. And they have a bunch of documents that are automatically approved and moved up there, published to their website. And this is all fine, but you need to know that this stuff is there so that you can make appropriate decisions about how to deal with it. The last thing you want is to be in the middle of your project and have someone come to you and say, well, what are we doing about all these files? And this is the first time you've ever heard of them. And even if you have a good understanding of everything that's on your network share drive, you don't have any surprises, well, what kind of documents do you have? How many of the each kind do you have? How old are they? Well, it's important to have numbers about these kind of things so that you can use them for measurement and to communicate how you are doing. Even if it's as simple as knowing I started with a thousand documents, I moved a thousand documents, I still have a thousand documents, so I didn't lose any. That's important information to have. And this is probably axiomatic, but if you really know what's on your network share drive, and you know how it's organized, so that you don't need to do an inventory, well, it's probably not that big of a mess to begin with. Maybe you don't need to do a cleanup, or if you do, it's going to be a relatively straightforward project. The second step in the Western IAM process is classification. The principle for this step is exemplified by the quote, I may not be able to define it, but I know it when I see it. You may think this is a weird quote to use, especially when you consider that it was originally made in a U.S. Supreme Court decision on pornography. But I'm going to use it in a somewhat backhanded fashion, because this is not a principle that you want to rely on when you are doing classification. You can't just rely on someone looking at a file and instinctively knowing where to put it, because everyone is going to have a different opinion about where it should go. Your classification system needs to have clear rules about what is what, so that everyone can work on the same understanding. The classification step is where we take the individual files and we determine what kind of a thing this is, and what are the attributes or qualities that make it what it is. Then we group together the files that are the same kind of things. To create the classification, we can look at two different files and ask ourselves, is there a difference? And does it make a difference? As a trivial example, we could classify files based on how many characters there are in the file name, but this obviously wouldn't be a useful classification. We need a classification or a grouping that exposes a relevant difference. Once we have identified the different types of files that we have, 
we can determine what attributes are relevant for those types. The attributes may also include security, retention, privacy, anything that is going to make a difference in how we handle the file. Once we have the classification plan designed, we can start to fill out the attributes on individual files. And there we run into a problem. A shared network drive typically has very limited ability to assign metadata. So the information to fill out the attributes is going to have to come from somewhere else. Fortunately, people can be very clever when putting information into file names. There can be multiple pieces of information in the file name, such as ID numbers or significant dates, or maybe someone's initials. These can all be used to populate attributes. The shared network drive will have date fields that can be used to fill out date attributes. Also, the folder structure may have been used to collect together files with similar attributes, so we can often leverage the folder structure to fill out attributes. And sometimes we need to open the file itself in order to pull relevant attributes out from the contents of the file. The next step is organize. Here is where we get to sing along with Kermit the Frog from Sesame Street, singing, some of these things belong together, some of these things are kind of the same. I will spare you my singing the song, but those of you of a certain generation are already hearing it in your heads. In classification, we grouped like files together in types. Now we need to group files together in a way that makes them easy to store and then find again. We do this by creating a browse structure. A browse structure is not the same as a classification plan. We see too many records managers trying to get users to file their documents into a classification plan, and it just never works well. A browse structure is a multi-level hierarchical tree structure that tries to assist a user in navigating by presenting choices at each level. Each choice leads to other choices until the user arrives at a location that is appropriate to either store or retrieve the document. In a browse structure, there may be levels that don't correspond to classification differences, such as when invoices are organized by vendor name and fiscal year. And you have the option of putting multiple different document types together, like if you have a project file that contains invoices and CAD drawings and job applications. A browse structure that assists users in finding things is useful, but it isn't always enough. Sometimes you may have a specific piece of information that you are looking for, but it isn't necessarily related to the choices presented by the browse structure. Like if you have an invoice number, but the invoices are organized by vendor and fiscal year. In this case, you want to be able to search for the document instead of browsing to it. And here is something that most people don't think about, but I think provides tremendous value. Provide a structure for transient or temporary files. Provide a place where people can put things, but they will be automatically deleted after 90 days. This gives people a place to put things they aren't sure about without forcing them to pick a permanent spot for it. Now that we have all of the planning done, it's time to do the actual migration. As Napoleon Hill said, plan your work then work your plan. You might be migrating to a completely new system, or you might be just restructuring your files within your existing shared drive. Either way, there are a few things to be aware of. I think it's somewhat obvious that migration is going to have to be an automated process. It's unrealistic to expect that you are going to be able to migrate a reasonably sized shared drive with manual processes. An automated process implies that you need to have rules to tell the computer how to move files from one place to another. And you probably want to take an iterative approach to defining the rules. You don't want to try and completely specify the entire process in one go. When you take an iterative approach, the 80-20 rule applies. By this I mean that on your first go around of defining the most obvious rules, you're going to get about 80% of your files. Then you go back and refine those rules and add more rules, which is going to take more effort than the first time around, and you'll get 80% of the files that are left. So you'll have moved 96% of your files. Then you refine and add more rules again, which takes even more effort, and you'll get another 80% for a total of around 99% of your files. If you keep refining and adding rules, you keep reducing the number of leftovers, 
but at some point you need to ask if it is worth it to migrate the remainder of the files. Maybe it is sufficient to just migrate the leftovers into a miscellaneous folder, put a one-year retention on them, and if nobody's looked for them in a year, then just delete them. Now that all of your files are migrated into a new system, you might think that your job is over. But it's not. Life is a journey, not a destination. And now that you have a new system, you will need to manage that system. It is an unfortunate fact of life that as soon as users get their hands on a system, it will start to degrade. It requires ongoing, consistent effort to maintain a system. The first thing to do is to train the users. You can't expect that they are just going to inherently know where to put things and how to use the system. You will have staff turnover and your existing staff will need reminders, so you will have to do retraining on a regular basis. You will also have to monitor the system so that you are aware if any issues arise. No one wants to be the records police, but if you know what is happening, you can take action before something becomes a problem, whether that action is communication, or additional training or modifications to the system. And nothing stays the same forever, as this last year has certainly taught us. If business requirements change, your system will also need to change to reflect new realities. So, to review. First, you need to take an inventory of what is actually on your shared drive. Make sure you know where you are starting from. Next, Classify your files into types that are representative of those files and that capture the significant differences between file types. Assign attributes to those types, insert, including security, retention, privacy, or other characteristics important to your organization. Organize your files in a way that makes it easy for users to store and find the files that they work with. Once you have a plan for what your new system should look like, Copy files from the old system to the new system. Use an incremental, iterative approach to move from one stage to the next. And finally, manage the new system. Invest the time and effort necessary to keep your system operating optimally. Here is my executive summary. If you don't take away anything else from this presentation, these are the three most important things to tell your bosses. The first and most important thing is to start by creating an inventory of your existing files. Your biggest payback will be if you can identify things that should be managed outside of your shared drive and can be immediately excluded from consideration. Second, use your classification and organization steps to identify transient or temporary files and create a place for them. Up to 30% of your files could be transient files that you could delete if only you knew where they were. And finally, multiply your expertise by training your users. Training people to effectively use the system is probably the least sexy part of your job, but it also probably provides the greatest return. And, as promised, here's my contact information. This is the part where I would normally answer any questions. Hopefully, you've been able to ask questions in the chat, and I have answered them there. The ARMA Information Conference is coming to an end, but there's still time for you to check out the Western IM virtual booth using the ARMA Conference app. If you wanted to chat about your specific situation, you can drop me an email at daryl.schrader at westernim.com. And you can also check out our website at westernim.com. That's it for me, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference.